and especially when it comes to theology. You know, it's not probably going to happen on Twitter. (laughs) You know, there's just, you got to be able to build a relationship and have a deeper, more meaningful discussion. See yourself as a student or a learner. There's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth. You know, we ought to be listening twice as much as we're talking. Okay, next week we're going to cover chapter two, what is Phronima, and we're going to look at, and this is going to be fun, Phronima in the Bible, we're going to look at the mind of Christ, Phronima in the Fathers, Phronima for Orthodox Christians' life and mentality, and then the indefinable nature of Phronima. And for the sake of those listening by way of podcast, if you have questions or comments about today's lesson, you can write to me at eastwest at ancientfaith.com. At the intersection of East and West is a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. You can find out more about Deacon Michael Hyatt at his website, which is michaelhyatt.com. That's michaelhyatt.com. Boldly proclaiming the truth of the risen Christ. This is Ancient Faith Radio. Timeless Christianity, 24 hours a day. Search the scriptures as Christ our God said in the This is Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Join us for an interactive verse-by-verse study of the Bible with one of Orthodoxy's most respected biblical scholars. Study along with us and share your comments and questions by calling 855-237-2346. That's 855-237-2346. Here now is Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master who loves mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds to understand thy gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living both thinking and doing, such things that are well-pleasing to Thee. For Thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to Thee we ascribe glory together with Thy Father who is from everlasting, and then all holy and good and life-giving Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Well, hello, dear brothers and sisters, and welcome to Search the Scriptures Live. I'm Dr. Jeannie Constantinou, and today's date is July 11th, 2022, and we are continuing our study of Pentecost. We're only covering the first few chapters of Acts, actually, maybe just these two and one other because of a very famous story that someone asked me to talk about. But right now, we're still in chapter two. Last week, We talked about the actual event of Pentecost, and this week we're supposed to talk about St. Peter's speech, because after the apostles and the others who were with them in the upper room received the Holy Spirit, they went out to the streets, and people heard them speaking in different languages, and then Peter stood up and made a speech. And we were going to take a look at this now. I don't know how far we're going to get, because... I hate to tell you, Chrysostom has a lot to say about St. Peter, and uh, I I don't think you're going to mind very much because it's absolutely wonderful, but, you know, I always think this is how much I'm going to cover. This is what I intend to cover, and then I'll read Chrysostom and say, oh my gosh, I I don't want to pass over this. It's so worth listening to because so much of what Chrysostom says when he talks about St. Peter is so applicable to us today in terms of he does a contrast. He compares St. Peter to Plato, the philosopher, okay? But there's so much um, spiritual benefit that we can derive from thinking about the, the points that he is making and how they still apply very much to us today. We shouldn't say, well, Chrysostom was preaching in the fourth century or now maybe the early fifth century, 
and this doesn't apply to us. It applies in many ways more so to us today in our culture, and we'll talk about that. But Peter's speech is a very important for theological reasons, of course, for historical reasons, and we're going to talk about it. If not, if we don't begin it this week, we certainly will next week. But um, it's it's important because it creates a kind of um, understanding. It it preserves for us what the early church was saying about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not just that he rose, but how this was foretold by the prophets. And it preserves the way the early church evangelized the Jews. Remember, all of these believers in Jesus, they're all Jews, and they all spread the gospel right there in Jerusalem. They didn't leave Jerusalem for, for quite a while. We'll, we'll talk more about that. But, uh, but it's very important, these kinds of speeches preserve for us the kinds of arguments and statements that the first Christians were making to their fellow Jews, okay? Of course, there are other discussions and arguments that were made to the Greeks, the ones who did not know um, the Jewish faith at all. We're not talking about Hellenized Jews. We're talking about people who were former pagans. So that's a very important thing, and we're going to take a look at some of the things that he was saying in that speech. But before we begin, I received an email from somebody about something that I neglected to talk about last week, and it's a good point, so I'm going to read it. And this comes to us from Scott in Glendale, Arizona. Dear Dr. Jeannie, I love your podcasts. I never listen live, but I always listen at some point during the week it aired. Today was that day. For the first part of the show, you talked about why Pentecost was on Pentecost. And now, if you missed that show last week, um, the Christian Feast of Pentecost happens on the same exact date or day as the Jewish Feast of Pentecost. The Jews also had a feast called um, Shavuot, or in Greek, it was called Pentecosti because it was 50 days after Passover. And it was the day that they remembered receiving the law on Mount Sinai. In other words, that they celebrated receiving the law. And it was very deliberate that the Holy Spirit came upon the church on that day because we are guided not by the law of Moses, not by the thousands of Jewish regulations, but by the Holy Spirit. That's what is supposed to guide us. And so that's the, the sort of the Christianization, the, the Christian fulfillment of that Jewish feast. So Scott writes, I liked your discussion, but you did not mention the most basic reason. Jews were required to be in Jerusalem on that day for that celebration. He's right about that. And so I'm going to continue here with Scott's uh, email. Deuteronomy 16, 16, three times a year, quote, three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Festival of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And again, in Exodus 23, 17, it says the same thing. So Scott says, so assuming that Jews were actually following the Mosaic law, then substantially all of Israel was present in Jerusalem for the resurrection of the Messiah. And substantially all of Israel was present in Jerusalem for the pouring down of the Holy Spirit. And because substantially uh, all of Israel would be there, that is why Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. And that's why the Christian Pentecost occurred on the Jewish Pentecost plus everything you said. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just adding the specific Old Testament law. Okay, so this is an excellent point. I'm not certain to, uh, first of all, I don't think that Jesus told them to be there because all of Israel would be there necessarily. Uh, he said, wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So they waited. Definitely, there were more people in Jerusalem for the feast, for the Jewish feast of Pentecost, because of the Jewish feast of Pentecost, than there would be otherwise. That's, that is true. Um, whether or not all of Israel would be there, I, I don't really know. I don't necessarily think so, but definitely there were more people there. So Scott is correct. And I mentioned this also in my book, The Crucifixion of the King of Glory. I mentioned the fact that people that Jewish men were required to come to Jerusalem three times a year for these three feasts 
um, Passover, Pesach, Pentecost, Shavuot, and booths or Sukkot. Those three feasts, that's the one that happens in where they build the little booths. They're all connected to Exodus, by the way. Pentecost, uh, I mean, Passover, how they got out of Egypt. Pentecost, the receiving of the law 50 days later when Moses came down from Mount Sinai. And then uh, they're wandering in the wilderness, which happened afterwards during that period when they were in the wilderness being guided by Moses. That's what they celebrate for the Feast of Booths or or Sukkot, uh, Sukkah. So, no, I I reversed those. At any rate, um, Sukkot is the the Feast of Booths, uh, and Sukkah is the Pentecost. So, um, at any rate, the point is that that these were called the pilgrim festivals because people were supposed to, Jewish men, if they were able to come to Jerusalem for those feasts, they were required to. Now, when this law was given to Moses, or it was, let's say, incorporated in the Torah, written down in the Torah, um, they were everybody was living in the Holy Land, right? But by now, by the first century, Jews are living all over. The Jews are in diaspora. The majority of Jews were not living in the Holy Land. They were living in Babylon and Egypt and Greece and Asia Minor and, and uh, you know, Rome and Ly- Libya and all kinds of places. So many, many Jewish men could not fulfill that requirement. And by the way, the requirement is only for Jewish men. And uh, if, I, so you had to be of a certain, You it was required of you if you were physically able, and also if you could be identified as a man. (laughs) Women were not required to attend, but they often did if they could. So if you're, you know, Jesus's family and you live in Galilee, you would definitely go down to Jerusalem. It would take you two or three days to walk there from Galilee, but you would go. If you were living in Egypt, you would probably go because then again, you've got a walk of, you know, three or four days, but you could get there in time for these festivals. If you lived in Libya or in um, Rome or Babylon, did you attend every festival? Probably not. But this is one reason why it says here in chapter 2 of Acts that there were devout men living in Jerusalem from every nation under the sun. Because in order to keep that commandment, you kind of had to live there all the time. Because you simply couldn't get on a boat from, you know, Rome and get to uh, to Jerusalem for for Passover and then necessarily stay there until Pentecost and then through August so that you could celebrate the Feast of Booth, Sukkot, and then go all the way back. I mean, you'd be in Jerusalem half of the year. Now, what if you're a slave? And there were Jewish slaves in Jerusalem, in, in Rome, for example. That's how a lot of them ended up in Rome, by the way. They they were captured and taken to Rome as slaves. Now they're free necessarily, but they're, they're, they might be poor. So they can't just, they can't necessarily meet that requirement. So, um, but what Scott was saying, that they're substantially all of Israel, you know, in a great measure, there would have been many, many more people who would be present, but not everybody even all Jewish men could not necessarily meet that requirement. Um, And we kind of see this in the book of Acts when Paul is rushing to get to Jerusalem, if possible, by the Feast of Pentecost. All right. Um, And that when he did arrive there, he went to the temple. It does tell us that. I don't remember exactly the reference, but he was trying to get there in time for Pentecost because that was still a requirement and he was still keeping certain elements. He was, he was of course, remembering the, the Christian feast of Pentecost, but we know that he went to the temple also. So um, it was sometimes not ca- uh, impossible for all, all Jewish men. They would have wanted to, but the most devout would decide to live in Jerusalem so that they could be present for all of those festivals, okay? But thanks all, uh, very much for reminding me of that, the fact that I didn't mention that. I should have. Thanks, Scott. So, um, all right. So Chrysostom, by the way, knew 
about that. He doesn't specifically mention it, but I'm going to read for you. I, I was re rereading Chrysostom's sermon about this, and he says when he talks about the Jewish men, the devout men who were there for in, living in Jerusalem from every nation under the sun, he, this is what Chrysostom says, observe their piety. They pronounce no hasty judgment, but are perplexed. In other words, they're confused. Why are these men speaking in different tongues? How is it that these men from Galilee know my native uh, dialect and I'm living here from Libya or Cyrene or I'm here from Babylon or or Parthia or Medes or they're Elamites or, you know, they're from all, every nation or they're from Rome or they're from Crete, okay? So Chrysostom notes this and says, um, it was in order that they might have it in their power in compliance with the law to appear thrice in the year in the temple that they dwelt there, these devout men from all nations. You see, Chrysostom mentions that that is why they were, they were present. So he knows about that. I just didn't mention it. Now, so these are devout men. And Chrysostom also notes that the devout Jewish men were perplexed by what they heard. But the others who were, weren't so devout said, oh, they're just full of new wine, right? So let's, let's read that. So you might be reminded. So now there were devout men dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, that is the sound of the Holy Spirit coming upon uh, the believers, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and wondered, saying, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of them in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Now, we, last week we talked about whether or not they only heard them in their language or they were actually, or whether the apostles and others, the first Christians, were actually speaking those language. We talked about that. Chrysostom concludes for good reason, and so does Gregory, the theologian, that they were actually speaking the languages. They weren't just heard. They, it, it isn't that the foreigners were hearing that language. It's that that the believers were actually speaking those languages. So we talked about that last time. So these were devout men, and they were perplexed. Chrysostom notes the difference between that reaction and other Jews on the streets of Jerusalem who said, but others mocking said they are filled with new wine. You see, Chrysostom men mentions that. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about this. Chrysostom says that we're in, in his homily number four in Acts. They are full of new wine. Quite a thing, of course, is it not? That men in the midst of such dangers and dreading the worst and such despondency have the courage to utter such things. And observe, since this was unlikely, because they would not have been drinking, the people who are in the midst of dangers are the apostles, okay? Not the people who are making fun of them. When you hear a foreign language that you do not know, it sounds like gibberish. So if they just sounded like they were babbling. It sounded like blather. You know, somebody... If you if it's a, a language you might have some familiarity with, you recognize it as a foreign language like Spanish or French, you will recognize what it is. But if it is something very foreign, foreign, it sounds, you know, it's unrecognizable to you. So so they were making fun of them. And um, Chrysostom says that those people, they ascribe the whole matter to the wine and say they're full of wine. But Peter stood up and began to speak. So let us continue reading from Acts of the Apostles. What happens after others said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, 
since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he begins to talk about the prophecy that was fulfilled by the coming of the Holy Spirit on that day. All right. And this is what he says. And in the last days it shall be, God dictates, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. On your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dream, shall, shall dream dreams. Yes, and on my men servants and maid servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and in the signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great day of the Lord comes, the great and manifest day. And it shall be that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Peter begins with this prophecy and Chrysostom begins to talk about not only the meaning of the prophecy, but about the person of Peter himself and how it was that he and the other apostles were completely transformed by Pentecost. Of course, they were transformed because of the resurrection of Christ, but also by the coming of the Holy Spirit. And First Chrysostom notes that Peter stands up immediately. This is literally moments after the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the church, not hours even later, but almost immediately they come out of the upper room and they begin to preach. Peter begins to preach. Here he is, though, as usual, as we have already seen so often in the Gospels, that Peter takes upon the, himself this role of spokesman for all of the apostles. He was recognized as the leader of the apostles and the Orthodox Church recognizes him. As a matter of fact, we call him the leader of the apostles. That has nothing to do with making him the Pope, by the way. We recognize historically he was the leader of the apostles. How this became the papacy, the modern Catholic papacy, is a different story, but that, that doesn't support the, the modern ideas of, of the Catholic papacy. Only the his leadership position among the disciples, which was indisputable. Now, Peter gets up to make a speech. Now, one thing which you will see, and this is not his first speech in Acts. His first speech in the book of Acts was earlier. It was in chapter one, when Peter got up before the whole multitude. And this is how we find out how many there were. There were about 120 people who were present including the family of Jesus, the brothers of Jesus, his mother, and many of the women disciples and others. We can assume it was the 12 or the 11 after they chose the 12th one and the 70 and the family of the Lord and the female disciples and others. So there were many uh, believers who were gathering every day and they were praying in the upper room between the time of the resurrection and the, t the day of Pentecost. So, this is how we find out how many there were. It tells us in the book of Acts that there were about 120. And then Peter stood up and believed that they gave a little speech about how they had to replace Judas. And that, that's how we found out what happened to Judas, remember? So Peter gets up and makes a speech at that time. And now in chapter two, he also gets up and makes a speech. And elsewhere, we see him making speeches. Later, we see St. Stephen the proto-martyr, or you could say Stephen, the proto-martyr making speeches, a speech, a very important speech. And Paul makes many speeches in the book of Acts. So I wanted to call this to your attention that the book of Acts is full of speeches. Now, why is that? Is it that people just made more speeches? Yes, they did. That's part of the reason. Because people did not learn primarily from books. They learned from hearing. They would go places where people were speaking to various kinds of gatherings, including to the church. Later, when Chrysostom is preaching, what I'm going to read for you, his, his sermon about Plato and Peter 
there were people in the audience of the church. Now, here he was, the Archbishop of Constantinople, when he gives this sermon on the book of Acts and talks about contrast Peter and Plato. But there were people in the congregation who were not Christians. They were pagans. And there were, there were Jews who were present. And there were heretics who were present, Marcionites and Arians and others. And these people would actually go to the church to hear him preach or other famous orators. This is how St. Augustine became a Christian. He was in Milan. He was teaching rhetoric. He was a Manichaean, which is not even a Christian, but a, not even a Christian heresy, but a non-Christian religion. And he heard about St. Ambrose, who was the Bishop of Milan, that he was a good speaker. So Augustine went to listen to Ambrose of Milan. And he started to come back. And this is how he became convinced of the, of the Christian faith. So it is not what was not uncommon. People didn't have the smartphones and the TV and the radio and the Internet to entertain them. So it was very, very typical for non-believers to also be present in the congregation because the sermon is given after the gospel. And so Chrysostom or other famous orators would expound on the gospel and they would take that opportunity to talk about moral issues, to refute heresy and other things too. So they knew that it was a very mixed congregation. Okay. So, um, so this is people, even in Chrysostom's time, you know, you're talking about a time before the printing press and a time before mass media, a time before electronic media. So people learned things by listening to speakers. And that's why oratory was so important. To have the skills of an orator was considered very, very important. That's how you go. It's like today, it, it is important if you're writing a book, you have to be a good author. Otherwise, nobody's going to read your book. They have editors maybe to clean up your writing. But you have to be able to write and to speak. So today we are more persuaded, I think, by visual, by the visual medium. But in those days, oratory was an essential skill. So Chrysostom begins to talk about, compare Peter to Plato. Now, we, we started, I started explaining this because the book Acts of the Apostles is written in the typical style of Hellenistic history. That is, this is how ancient people wrote history. Um, people like St. Luke and others who were historians uh, Roman and Greek ancient historians, their their particular um, story, the, they didn't. They wrote it in a kind of uh, um, narrative style. They didn't write history the way we would, just giving you a bunch of facts. They made it interesting by telling a story, and in order to give you more information, they would have the character give a speech. And in that speech, you learned about the things that happened. You learned about the character of the person who was speaking. This is how they would write history. And this is Hellenistic historical writing style. Okay, that's what we see in the book of Acts. So St. Luke, who was himself a historian and, and a very educated man, writes in this style. So what does that mean for us? That means that these speeches might not necessarily be word for word exactly what St. Peter said on the day of Pentecost or exactly what St. Paul said uh, when he appeared before um, the uh, Herod Agrippa, okay, or exactly what St. Stephen would have said, said to the Sanhedrin. It probably contains a lot of what they would have said, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's word for word because there was no tape recorder. There was no, nobody there taking notes to trans, transcribe what they said. But it is in some and basically what they would have said. Why is that? Because when the first Christians went out to preach and when the apostles went out to preach, they made the same kinds of arguments again and again and again and again again. 
to that particular audience. When they were speaking to Jews, they talked about these particular prophecies. When they were speaking to Greeks, that is to pagans, they talked about Jesus in this way. In other words, they, they tailored their presentation about who Jesus was, why he's the Messiah and the Lord to their audience. And the early church knew all of these passages. So, so Peter is going to quote for us, the, he just did, from the prophet Joel. And later he's going to quote to us from other passages in the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures, to try to convince this Jewish audience that he's standing in front of on the day of Pentecost, why Jesus Christ is the Messiah and the Lord. So these speeches are extremely important because they preserve for us the church's memory of what scriptures were important in the early church, not the New Testament, because there was no New Testament, but scriptures from the Old Testament that the apostles used to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, not just a human Messiah, but the Lord. You see, that's why that is so important. So, so first, uh, we're going to talk about, we're, first of all, let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to see what Chrysostom tells us about St. Peter and the other apostles and their bravery about standing up on this very first day of the church, what we call traditionally the birthday of the church. You can say it's not the birthday of the church or this other reason. That's fine. But this is often, the day of Pentecost has often been called the birthday of the church because this is the first day that people got baptized and received the Holy Spirit and became Christians. Okay. So, Let's go ahead and take a break at this moment. When we come back, we'll hear what Chrysostom says about St. Peter and the apostles and their bravery. Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. For all of us, male or female, parent or not, that's what it's often like, isn't it? It's at the end of our own tether that the miracle happens. It is in our greatest weakness that God's strength is known. It's when we decrease that He can increase. It's in losing our life that we find it. To put it another way, it's in the spot where St. Morwenna falls down, exhausted that her spring rises up. It's when the people of God curse Moses in the wilderness and wish themselves back in Egypt that they hear the crack of the staff, the gush of water through the rock. It's when God himself is spat upon and mocked and bleeding and dead that the glorious resurrection is ushered in. From Seven Holy Women, Conversations with Saints and Friends, now available as an audiobook at Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. All right, so let's see what Chrysostom tells us about St. Peter. And this is homily 4 on Acts of the Apostles by St. John Chrysostom. In the former place, you saw his providential forethought. Here you see his manly courage, this is St. Peter. For if they were astonished and amazed, the uh, the men of, you know, of Judea, the Jerusalem, was it not as wonderful that he should be able in the midst of such a multitude to find language, he, an unlettered and ignorant man? If a man is troubled when he speaks among friends, much more might he be troubled among enemies and bloodthirsty men. And it says that he stood up with the eleven. And what is meant by with the eleven? It means that they expressed themselves through one common voice, and he was the voice, the mouth of all. The eleven stood by as witnesses to what he said. He that spoke with great confidence and they might perceive the grace of the Spirit through that. 
He who had not endured the questioning of a poor girl, <laughs> think about that, a servant girl. Remember that the first person who questioned Peter when he was in the courtyard, when Jesus was on trial, was a servant girl. Aren't you one of his disciples? No, no, not me. I'm not one of his disciples. And that was just a servant girl. She had absolutely no power. She had no position. She had no status. She was a slave. And Peter cowered in front of her. He was afraid in front of her. So this is what Chrysostom is reminding us about, which is, that was just a few weeks before, remember? For us, it was 2,000 years ago. For Peter, it was just weeks before that he denied the Lord in front of this little servant girl. You see? He who had not endured the questioning of a poor girl now, in the midst of the people breathing murder, he discourses with such confidence that this very thing becomes an unquestionable proof of the resurrection. Isn't that interesting? It is the change that took place in Peter and the other apostles that is absolute proof of the resurrection. And of course, Chrysostom is right. We cannot explain the existence of the church absent the resurrection. We can't explain the behavior of the apostles without their experience of the resurrection that they became like lions. They experienced Christ risen from the dead and they saw him and they spoke with him and they ate with him and they touched his wounds and they embraced him in a physical, in his physical sense. It's a bodily resurrection. They experienced that again and again and again over those 40 days between the day of Pascha and the day of the Ascension. This kind of, uh, of experience was so profound that it changed them completely and they were not afraid of anything anymore. And we see this, of course. But now they also have the Holy Spirit, which has come in its fullness at Pentecost. And this also changes people. It, sh it should change us. And if it hasn't changed us, that's our fault. But what we have, what we have received when we were chrismated, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, when we were sealed with the grace of the Holy Spirit, is exactly what they received. And if we are not raising people from the dead the way Peter did, it's because we haven't embraced that. It, we received it, but we didn't actualize it. We, haven't, we don't live for Christ the way they did. Because all of us, should be able to do all of the things that the apostles did, including raising people from the dead. Because it wasn't Peter who raised them, it was the Lord who raised them through the prayers of Peter, Peter because of the sanctity of Peter and the other apostles. And we lack their faith, we lack their conviction, we lack, the, we lack so much, but it's not because we're not capable, but because we say, well, that's not for me, or I don't want to make those kinds of sacrifices. I don't want to stand out in public. I don't want people looking at me. <laughs> I don't want to get up and preach. Now, that doesn't mean all of us are called to preach. The saints weren't all preachers. They weren't all priests. They weren't all bishops. They weren't all apostles. But nonetheless, by their prayers, they did all of these things. But we either, we don't really want, we don't really love God. We don't really want to sacrifice. We don't really, you know, we, we want to have our lives, the comfort of our lives, and still say we're Christians, right? Here's what Chrysostom said. For wherever the Holy Spirit is present, he makes men of gold out of men of clay. Look at Peter now. Examine that timid one one devoid of understanding, as Christ said, are you as yet without understanding? The man who after that marvelous confession, and what was Peter's confession? Should I, do I have to remind you? I will remind you. Maybe you remember, but I will remind you in case you forgot. What was Peter's confession? The Lord said, who do people say that I am? And the apostle said, well, some say Jeremiah, some say a prophet, some say John the Baptist. And who do you say that I am? And they were all silent, except for St. Peter, who said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's called the confession of St. Peter. The acknowledgement, when we say confession, confession, 
It doesn't necessarily mean that you're confessing sins. He acknowledged, he recognized, and he said who Christ was. Maybe the others thought maybe he was that, but only Peter actually said it. He confessed it. He acknowledged it. Okay? So he says, that man, after that marvelous confession, was called Satan. Because it is after that, it is after the acknowledgement of who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Lord, the Son of the living God, that Jesus begins to talk to them about his coming passion. And that he's going to be arrested and going to be put to death in Jerusalem. And then later Peter comes to him and says, oh, you know, Lord, we, we, we can't allow that to happen. You mustn't go to Jerusalem. You can't get crucified. We can't let that happen. And that's when the Lord says, get thee behind me, Satan. Right? What a contrast. Because, and here's where the word phronima is used in the Gospels, the only place, you are not thinking like God thinks, but you're thinking as men think. So first, Peter had this illumination, and that's what Christ said. It is not flesh and blood that revealed that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So Peter had this remarkable insight that was given to him by God, but then he returned to the thinking of men, and then he said, no, you can't go to Jerusalem. We don't want you to be crucified, right? And so Chris, Chrysostom brings out this remarkable contrast. This person who had been called Satan, he wasn't really called Satan, but he, he was, Chris, Chris, you know, Jesus recognizes that Satan is speaking through Peter, right? And Chrysostom continues, consider also the unanimity of the apostles. They gave to him the office of speaking, for it was not necessary that all should speak. And he lifted up his voice. And what does that mean? He spoke to them with great boldness. This is what it means to be a spiritual man. I love that. This is what it means to be a spiritual man, said St. John Chrysostom. Why is it important that he said that and that we pay attention to this, dear brothers and sisters? That Chrysostom said, this is what it means to lift up your voice and speak with boldness. Because, now notice, P Peter didn't speak with boldness and arrogance. Didn't go, he didn't speak to promote himself. Why is it? Because some of us think that to be spiritual means to always be quiet. And never to say anything that upsets anybody else. That is not what it is to be spiritual. Such a thing it is to be a spiritual man, says St. John Chrysostom. And then he adds this, Chrysostom. Only let us also bring ourselves into a state appropriate for the grace from above. And all becomes easy. So he spoke because he had the grace of God. For as a man of fire falling into the midst of straw would take no harm, but do it to others, not that he could take any harm, but they in assailing him, destroy themselves. For the case here was just as if one carrying hay should attack one bearing fire. Even so did the apostles encounter these, their adversaries, with great boldness. We have to recognize, dear brothers and sisters, we have fire and falsity, apostasy, Immorality is hay. That doesn't mean that people can't hurt us physically. But just as the Lord said, you know, people can really do you no harm. They might kill you, but they won't do you any real harm. But we don't want to die. We don't want to have any harm. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to lose popularity. We don't want to, people to think ill of us because we want to be loved. Isn't that what's driving our culture? Isn't that what's going on around us? We don't want to stand out. We don't want to say this is wrong because we're afraid. We want to be liked. And, and, and you know what? Facebook knows that. That's why they put the like button there. Do you know how much Facebook changed, how much its value um, its monetary value and the, the following and the use of Facebook increased because of the like button. 
People go on to see how many people like what they posted. It's appealing to the lowest common denominator of humanity, and that is we all want, we all seek social approval. But Jesus said, they will hate you. And just know that they hated me first. That's what he said. And so if everybody likes us, we're probably doing something wrong. As St. John Chrysostom said, where there is no opposition, the gospel is not being preached. We have to be bold. We have to be brave. We have to get a spine, dear brothers and sisters. We have to stand up. We have to speak up when we see the wrong thing happening, including in our churches. This doesn't mean, I'm not talking about censuring people or telling them that they're wrong, but especially for the sake of others, when our hierarchs are becoming apostates, and perhaps you know what I'm talking about, when our hierarchs are embracing things that are wrong, that are not part of the Orthodox faith, we have a duty to speak up because we were given the Holy Spirit also. You know, the Orthodox Church does not teach that infallibility is in one apostolic see. The infallibility, infallibility of the church is not within one bishop or even all of the bishops together, but the entire church. The church has often been saved because of the conviction of the ordinary believer. The church has been saved from apostasy because of the ordinary believers. Now, I don't want to get off. I've already gone off on a tangent, tangent, but you know what I'm talking about. If not, you'll figure it out. So what, so Chrysostom is, is saying we have to be bold, but of course we have to have grace. We shouldn't be bold in proclaiming falsehood, but we have to be the, the, those of us who are in the church, who love the church, who understand what the church stands for, who are watching Orthodox Christianity being eroded by people who are chasing after popularity, who are chasing after the way of the world, who are seeking to secularize the church and to compromise the faith. Those of us who see that happening have to start standing up and speaking up. That's because we have the grace of the Holy Spirit. And it is incumbent upon us to do that. So we have to consider and imitate the lives of the apostles, their great sacrifices, their sufferings beyond number. When people criticize us, how can we, we, we know that we might be called upon to die for Christ. We have to be willing to die for Christ. How, how, this is, we all know this. This is why we fast, dear brothers and sisters. This is why we do spiritual exercises. But who, what good is our fasting and our spiritual exercises if we are unwilling to be criticized, to face rejection, and to be ostracized, to lose our jobs, to have somebody not like us on Facebook? What good is all of that spiritual exercise if we're not willing to face social pressures and say, I don't care. I'm going to say the truth regardless of what happens. When I say that we should say the truth, I don't mean that you have to confront people at church and tell them that they're sinners or whatever. I don't mean that. But when we are in a situation in which somebody says something that is incorrect and we know it to be incorrect, we are in that situation because Christ expects us to speak. We can speak mildly, but we cannot stay silent. Because by our silence, we are indicating our approval and our acceptance of this. And this will bring us to the attention of people, and people might not like us, and our family is saying, why are you saying this? You know, the family of Jesus also wasn't on board even with what the Lord was doing, right? At any rate, Chrysostom is saying this to his congregation, this very thing that I'm saying to you, because he understood this very well, because he lived in the Roman Empire, where everybody pursued honor 
and glory. The most important thing in the Roman Empire was that you have honor, personal honor and glory. And it it wasn't even the at least if uh, in our culture we wanted to be honored or have personal honor and integrity, that wouldn't be so terrible. But right now, what our culture wants is fame. It doesn't matter how you get it. Everybody wants to be a star on TikTok or YouTube or anything else. This is what especially the young people think is the most important thing. Everybody is following them, liking them, that they have X number of followers. This is the important thing. Well, in the culture of the, Ro of the Roman Empire, during the time of Christ, of the apostles, but also in the time of St. John Chrysostom, that was still the Roman Empire. People sought above all approval, social approval. That's why the cross is, is so important, understanding what the cross is. The cross is the opposite of that. Christ allowed himself to be placed on the cross, to suffer the humiliation of the cross, and the ostracism and, and, and of of everything that the cross stands for. That's why people laughed at the Christians. Don't think that 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 preaching about Jesus Christ was easy, because everybody laughed at the apostles. You don't hear that, because you're not around to hear their preaching. But people laughed at them and made fun of them because they are saying that God became a human being and died on a cross, being spat upon. This most and being beaten and dying in this and dying, hanging on a piece of wood, stripped of his clothing. This is something that is unimaginable in the Roman culture and also for the Jews, by the way, not just Romans and Greeks, but also for the Jews. Why would God decide to do that? That, that's what that's why Christians have to imitate the Lord. And this means to be willing to accept humiliation for the truth of who Jesus Christ is. So Chrysostom says this, didn't the apostles fight against poverty and hunger against humiliation and infamy? They were considered deceivers. That's true. Everybody called them liars. You think that the apostles were confronted with roses and banquets? What did they have? But don't you see, we have the apostolic faith. They paved the way for us, but it wasn't easy for them. Chrysostom says, did they not fight against ridicule and wrath and mockery? Some laughed at them. Others punished them. Were they not made a mark for the wrathful passions, for the merriment of whole cities? He means for the entertainment of cities. And do you know what that means? In the arena. Yeah. They were for the entertainment of entire cities. Exposed to factions and conspiracies, to fire and sword and wild beasts. With bare bodies, they took the field against all the armed. Though against them, against the apostles, all men had power. Against them were the terrors of rulers, the force of arms in cities and strong walls. What do we face? We face social ostracism, people not liking us on Facebook, somebody unfriending us because we had the guts to say the truth about the Orthodox Christian faith, to say the truth about the morality that we're supposed to have as Orthodox Christians, Christians not to go along with because we're afraid of what people will say about us, that we're narrow-minded, that we're hateful. That's how this whole society is now operating. If you don't like somebody, you're a hater. And we're afraid of being labeled a hater. Just say, no, I'm a Christian. So we have to have bravery. And so, so now people are saying, well, you can't say that. Why? Because you're not supposed to judge. No, we're not judging. We're just saying the truth of what the church has always stood for. And now we're afraid. And we are being silenced. Why only we, in this country, we have the right to speak. But of course, the pressure, the social pressure and the media pressure is coming down on upon us to silence us and to make us afraid. But we have to start speaking up, dear brothers and sisters. So I'm going to continue with what 
Chrysostom says, this, if the apostles were willing to do this in the arena when they were being tortured, how can we possibly stand before God and excuse ourselves when we're just afraid of criticism? Chrysostom says they were without experience, without the skill of the tongue. In other words, they weren't trained orators. In the condition of quite ordinary men, matched against juggling conjugers, against impostors, against the whole throng of sophists and rhetoricians and philosophers grown moldy in the academy and in the walls of the peripatetics. Against all of these, they fought the battle out. And the man whose occupation had been about lakes, St. Peter, mastered them so easily as if it was not even a contest with dumb fishes. For just as if the opponents he had to outwit, outwit were indeed more mute than fish, so easily did he get the better of them. So the apostles prevailed against all those people who were skilled in orator, all the people who, with the glibness of tongue and the smoothness of speech, and all the people who had the power of society with them. Now, did it appear that they had prevailed? Of course not. Peter was crucified, and they were thrown into prison, and they were mocked, and they were beaten, and people made fun of them. And they were, Paul was thrown into prison so many times he lost count. Paul was beaten so many times he lost count. And that happened to all of the apostles. So to the world, it looked as if they did not prevail. But we know the truth, don't we? So when you stand up for truth to the world, it looks like you're an idiot or you lose your friends and it looks like you have suffered some kind of harm. But what you have received are crowns in the kingdom of heaven. So in the end, what matters is that. What we will say when we stand before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. That's what matters. And we pray that at every divine liturgy. But do you mean it? Give us a good defense before the awesome judgment seat of my Christ. May we have a good defense before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. May we have it? Well, that's up to us. Whether or not we're going to collapse like Peter did before the resurrection, when we are confronted by a person, an ordinary human being, or whether or not we're going to act like people who have the Holy Spirit, have the gifts that were given to the, the apostles and the entire church at Pentecost, how are we going to act? So it is after this that Chrysostom begins to compare St. Peter with Plato. I just am I'm amazed at this. The philosopher probably the most important philosopher. He not only influenced society, not just in philosophy, strictly speaking, but so many ideas at the time, the whole culture was rooted in many respects in Platonic philosophy. There were many things that Plato taught and other philosophers taught that were universally presumed to be true. Now, Chrysostom is about to talk about this as somebody who knows this very well because Chrysostom received a Greek education, as did other fathers of the church. They were educated by pagans. St. Basil and St. John Chrysostom and St. Gregory the Theologian and uh, other fathers had a Greek education. And what this meant was that they were educated in all areas of Greek learning. And this meant not only science and mathematics and, and um, you know, astronomy and uh, and literature and history they 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 knew everything but they also learned about the the myths of the greeks and the uh, of course also oratory was part of this but also the greek uh, religion that was part of their education so the fathers were educated chrysostom didn't just come out of a cave and start preaching he was prepared for this but this also gave him knowledge of what to preach against, because he knew these things. They also learned philosophy. They learned the teachings of the great philosophers. And so because of this, this is how he was able to respond to this. Now, we don't see the fathers of the church praising the philosophers, but praising the apostles. 
So first of all, when we say fathers of the church, who are we talking about? We're talking about the great, the great thinkers and writers of the church. People like St. John Chrysostom and St. Basil the Great and St. Athanasios and others. We're not talking about your ordinary parish priest. I'm, I'm saying this because sometimes I hear from people who think when I say fathers of the church, I'm talking about the parish priest. We're talking about the people who stand as authorities in the church because they were saints of the church, but also men of great education and great piety and, and of deep, of great intellect. Okay, so they had the intellect, they had the education, but they also had the grace of God. They were saints of the church. These are not, not, not when we say fathers of the church, we don't mean ordinary priests. But because they had all of these things, because they had the grace of God, we follow them, we listen to them, because they are recognized as authorities in the church. Not because they brought something new, but because they preserved and articulated the apostolic faith that we're talking about, came to us this very first day of the church on the day of Pentecost. Now, we don't see the fathers of the church praising philosophers, but praising the apostles. And they say, and they would say with great pride, we follow not the philosophy of Aristotle and Plato, but the philosophy of the fishermen. That is apostolic tradition. So we're going to take a break at this moment. And when we come back, I want to talk to you about that. We will continue in this, um, talking about the fathers and philosophy and what Chrysostom said about Plato. So join me after the break. Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. New from Ancient Faith Publishing. The Crucifixion of the King of Glory. The Amazing History and Sublime Mystery of the Passion. Written by Eugenia Scarvellis Constantinou, Ph.D. It is my wish that this book will transport you on a journey of discovery, alternating between the dramatic, the informative, the spiritual, and the inspirational. But above all, it is my sincere hope that it will open the world of Christ to you and give you a behind-the-scenes glimpse into the last week in the life of Jesus Christ leading to a deeper appreciation of his passion that you will never forget. The Crucifixion of the King of Glory Now available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook at store.ancientfaith.com We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. Okay, so what we follow in the Orthodox Church is apostolic tradition, not philosophy. Now, philosophy has become the foundation for theology in the West, especially in the Catholic Church. They talk about faith and reason all the time. This is a very important thing for them. And that they follow, and this is because this became very much a part of the tradition in the Catholic West, especially in, you know, by, through Thomas Aquinas, who loved Aristotle. Now, I'm not being critical of the Catholic Church. That's their tradition. I'm just pointing out to you, this is why we are different in our theology and our methodology from the Catholic Church in particular, because they emphasize the use of human reason, Okay. Uh, we emphasize apostolic tradition. So we can see here how Chrysostom is emphasizing the apostles and apostolic tradition. And of course he, he makes fun of, uh, he makes fun of Plato here, mocking Plato. All right. The man whose occupation, this is still Chrysostom, had been about lakes, that's St. Peter, mastered them. In other words, he, silenced uh, the people of his day, the people who had education and learning, etc. He got the better of them. And Plato 
that talked a deal of nonsense in his day is silent now, while this man utters his voice everywhere, not among his own countrymen alone, but among the Parthians and the Medes and the Elamites and in India and every part of the earth. Where now is Greece with her big pretensions? Where the name of Athens? Where are the ravings of the philosophers? Now, why is Chrysostom saying this? Because the Christian faith took over the world, not the not Greek philosophy, even though, of course, Greek philosophy was still very important at the time of Chrysostom. Where are the ravings of the philosophers? He of Galilee, he of Bethsaida, he, Peter, the uncouth rustic, has overcome them all. Are you not ashamed? Confess it at the very name of the country of him who has defeated you? You remember when I told you that in front of Chrysostom, there were undoubtedly pagans listening to him and people who loved philosophy because this one, even at the time of Chrysostom, the greatest thing you could do is be a philosopher, be to become an orator, a rhetor. Confess it. Are you ashamed? to na learn the name of the country of him was defeated you. In other words, Peter is from this little fishing village. He's not from Athens, from B Bethsaida. But if you hear his own name too, learn that he was called Cephas, and much more will you hide your faces. This has quite undone you because you esteem this a reproach on account of the glibness of tongue, a praise, a want of glibness is a disgrace. Okay, so... He's pointing out that the fact that that in his culture, in Chrysostom's culture, um, oratory and ph philosophical education, learning was considered very, very important. The most important thing is to be a great orator. Now, sometimes Chrysostom talks about true philosophy and he praises true philosophy, but he doesn't mean Greek philosophy. He means the Christian faith. The true philosopher the true Gnostic, the true person of wisdom, is the Christian. Okay? You have not attained to the kingdom of heaven because you have not followed the road you have chosen, but leaving aside the royal road, so easy, so smooth, you have not attained the kingdom of heaven. Why then, is it asked, did Christ not exercise his influence upon Plato and upon Pythagoras? Because the mind of Peter was much more philosophical than their minds. So remember that the word philosophy means love of wisdom. Peter was more philosophical. Peter loved wisdom more than Plato, more than Pythagoras, more than Aristotle, more than any of them. Right? Because he loved true wisdom. True wisdom is to be found in Jesus Christ. This is another thing that we hear again and again and again and again by the Holy Fathers. True wisdom is to be a Christian. If you want to be wise, you, you will be a Christian. So the reason why Christ did not illuminate the mind of Plato is because Peter was a better philosopher. He was a greater lover of wisdom than they were. They were in truth. He means the Greek philosophers were children shifted about on all sides by vainglory. In other words, they wanted praise. They were proud. This is what motivated them. And look at what he says about Peter. This man, Peter, was a philosopher, the one apt to receive grace. If you laugh at these words, it's no wonder for those before laughed and said, these men were full of new wine. So you can imagine people were laughing when Chrysostom was preaching this. They were laughing at him for saying that Peter was more of a philosopher than Plato. So he knows that it, it, maybe they weren't laughing out loud. They were snickering or they were smiling. He, he's reading his audience. Chrysostom is looking at a, a church full of people many of whom were hostile to what he has had to say, but others who were in name Christians, but who weren't living the Christian life and who themselves considered their, their greatest ambition for their child to become a great orator. Don't think that parents were any different than they are today. 
What they wanted was their children to be successful in the ways of the world. Christians did. Because by now, by the time that Chrysostom is preaching, Christianity is not only legal, but it is the official religion of the empire. That doesn't mean that everybody was a Christian. They weren't. Christianity was still a minority religion. The majority of people were still pagans because that was tradition. You see, tradition was Rome. Tradition was paganism. Tradition was wealth and glory and honor and philosophy. That not only in Rome, but in Greece, Athens, and Alexandria. These were places of great learning. What you wanted to do is, if you had the money, you sent your child to Athens to be educated. That's what the families of Gregory the Theologian did and St. Basil the Great because they had money. So they sent to their, it's like sending your child to Harvard or Stanford or Oxford if you can afford it and they can get in. That's where you want them to be educated because that was a place of prestige. So even Christians aspired to that. So we have to recognize we're not so different from Chrysostom's audience. So today, people aspire. And if, if your, your priest stands up in church and tells you that the most important thing is not to get ahead in the world and you shouldn't care about, you know, what people think of you and that the more important thing is that to raise godly children and not worry about, you know, whether, where they're going to get into college. Um, a lot of people will not believe him or they won't agree with him. If, if they'll, they'll say, oh, what does this priest know? Right? Because we have the same mentality because we have become very worldly. So the, the people in Chrysostom's congregation are also primarily very worldly. They've become quite secularized. And so we have to recognize that he's speaking to us too. All right? We are children, like those worldly philosophers, shifted about on all sides by vain glory. We're pushed about by pride. Why? Why are we saying that? You might say, well, I, I'm not motivated by pride. Yes, you are. If you are afraid to speak up and say something, that is true in your little circle of friends because you're afraid that they won't like you anymore because you want to say, no, I think I might've mentioned this. I can't remember if I mentioned this one. Uh, somebody I was with at a table for lunch said that um, people, yeah, I think I did tell you about this. She was having a conversation with some ladies who are friends of hers who wanted to talk about the novel Fifty Shades of Grey, which is, a, which is about, you know, in perverse sexual practices. Excuse me for saying that, if you have children who are listening. Perversion. They all wanted to talk about it because they had read it. She didn't want to talk about it. I'm sure she hadn't read it. But she wasn't even interested in the conversation, and they didn't like that. But at least she had the guts to say, I'm not talking about that. And if you want to talk about it, fine, go ahead, but I won't be here and it, I don't know if she lost friends over that, but she may well have. And they were all Christians in name only. Let us not be Christians in name only, dear brothers and sisters. Okay? So this is a terrible thing if, if this is what, how we become a Christian. And we become a Christian and then we, we concede to the ways of the world because we're afraid. So we are like these people that Christian is Chris, Chrysostom is talking about. The philosophers, the great philosophers who were pushed about, who shifted because of pride. If we're more afraid of what people will say about us or they won't like us anymore, then rather than saying the truth, then we are not Christians. We are concerned more about our own ego and pride. Okay, that's right. This man, Chrysostom says, Peter was a philosopher, the one apt to receive grace. If you laugh at these words, it is no wonder. For those before laughed and said, these men are full of new wines. But afterwards, when they suffered those bitter calamities, exceeding all others in misery, when they saw their city falling in ruins and fire blazing and the walls hurled to the ground, those manifold horrors, which no one can find words to express, they did not laugh then. And you will laugh then, if you have the mind to laugh, when the time of hell is close at hand and the fire is kindled for your souls. Will you laugh then 
He's getting real here, dear brothers and sisters. Chrysostom is getting real. Will you laugh? If you're laughing now at what I'm saying, if you laugh when your priest tells you the truth, oh, will you laugh then when hell is close at hand? Here he mentions something because Peter, uh, I, I read the part that talks about the vapor and the blood, uh, the moon turning red as blood and the sun, sun going dark. These are signs of the end times, but they were also things that were experienced by the Jews to whom St. Peter was speaking that happened when, when Jerusalem fell, when the temple was destroyed, when Jerusalem fell. So Chrysostom is alluding to this and he's going to explain this. All right. But notice that he's not afraid to speak to the congregation about the fact of hell. And sometimes we laugh at these things and people laugh at our priests and at, at our bishops when they talk about these things. And Father Costa had people who would say to him, Father, we don't want to hear about these things. Father, I want to come to church and feel good. Why? Because they were listening to people like Joel Olstein, who never wants to say anything to make you feel bad, but only to make you feel good. Or back in the day, in the 70s and 80s, it was Robert Schuler of the Crystal Cathedral. He only wanted to talk about positive thinking, only good things about Christianity, only want to make you feel good. So our congregation, our, believe it or not, members of our church would come, listen to him on the television. And he was a, the, one of these preachers who only did positive, the power of positive thinking kind of thing. Then they'd come to church and Father Gosser would give them a, a nice sermon with real spiritual content. And they would complain to him, Father, I want to come to church and feel good. Chrysostom is facing the same exact thing. And he's going to talk about that. Chrysostom says, they, they laughed, but they're not laughing now. And you won't laugh either but what, in the future. But why do I speak about the future? I will show you where Peter is and what Plato is, the philosopher. Let us for the present examine their respective habits and let us see what the pursuits were of each. This one... Plato wasted his ha time teaching idle and useless dogmas and philosophical dogmas, he says, that we may learn that the soul of the philosopher becomes a fly. Most truly said, a fly. By the way, Hindus say that also. But what fly is worthy of such ideas? This man was full of irony and jealous feelings against everyone else. And he made it his ambition to introduce nothing useful, either out of his own head or others, and he produced the Republic, in which he enacted those laws full of gross immorality. Let the woman be in common. Let the virgins go about naked. Let them wrestle before the eyes of their lovers. Let there be common fathers. Let the children be in common. These are the teachings of Plato. But with us, the Christians, not nature makes common fathers. But the philosophy of Peter does this. What is the philosophy? Why do we have a common father? The common father is God the Father. That's how we have, we are all children of the same father, the philosopher of Peter. But for that other one, it, may, it did away with all paternity. For Plato's system only tended to make the real father next to unknown while the false one was introduced. It plunged the soul into a kind of intoxication and filthy wallowing. Have you heard about these TV shows where they try to find out the true father of a, of a baby? Have you, have you seen this? Isn't it unbelievable? There's a woman who comes on a TV show to find out, now because we can do that through genetics, who is the father of her baby? She doesn't know because she's been with too many men. And we watch this for entertainment today. This is exactly what Plato was talking about. Let all the women, let the men have be with, you know, in other words, there's no morality. The women should be with any man they want and all, all the women be in common. In other words, against marriage, uh, um, a, a single, you know, monogamy, 
let everybody have, let men have access to all women. That was a sort of the hippie lifestyle, right? Okay. But that was what Plato was promoting. And so Chrysostom is saying the, the, the children won't know who their father is. Well, we have that situation today. Okay. Here is what Chrysostom says. This plunges the soul into a kind of intoxication and filthy wallowing. Let all, Plato says, have intercourse with the women without fear. Now, Chrysostom says, where have the poets, even the poets, the Greek poets, did not even derive anything so ridiculous? He says that the human race does not differ even from the canines. Since among dogs, the male and the female do exactly the same things, let the women do the same things as men and let everything be turned upside down. In other words, Plato derived these ideas from looking at animals. Well, why do we have monogamy? Why should a man be jealous if their wife goes with another man? He shouldn't. Okay, instead, we should all, all the women should be in common. All the men should have access to all the women. And this is Chrysostom's analysis. Listen to this. For the devil has always endeavored to show that our race, he means the human race, is not more honorable than that of animals. And in fact, some have gone to such a pitch of absurdity to affirm that irrational creatures are endued with reason. And isn't that what we see today? People argue against monogamy by pointing to animals. Okay? Of course, animals are not endowed with reason. And so they say, well, animals have reason. And even some of the Greek philosophers said that animals have reason. In other words, whereas, this is Chrysostom, their leading men affirmed that our soul passes into flies and dogs and brute creatures, those who came after them being ashamed of this. In other words, some of them said that the soul goes into a fly or into other animals. And this is even Hinduism go, says this. Some of the philosophers who were embarrassed by this, being ashamed of this, fell into another kind of depravity, and they invested creatures with all rational science. In other words, Chrysostom said that because this was embarrassing, they said, well, even animals have the capacity of reason, okay? The animals, which were called into existence on our account, Chrysostom says, are in more respects more honorable than we are. Do you ever hear people saying that, that the animals are better than we are? Well, sometimes they are, we have to say, when people act worse than animals, that's for sure. The crow, some philosopher said, knows God and the raven likewise, and they possess gifts of prophecy and foretell the future. And there is justice among our animals and polity and laws. Perhaps you do not believe the things I'm telling you, Chrysostom is telling his audience, and you may well not, nurtured as you have been with sound doctrine. But notice that Chrysostom knows these things because as part of his education, he learned all of these things. Okay, so some of his congregation found this impossible to believe that they would actually say the philosophers would actually say that the soul goes into a fly. When you die, the soul migrates from your body into a fly or that animals have the capacity to reason that they're equal to us and that they have laws. And obviously we know that animals have certain things, but animals are, are driven by instinct and they were brought into existence for our sake. They're not equal to us. And I know people, this is why people say, oh, animals have rights. Well, no, animals don't really have rights, but animals, people want to give animals rights. And if animals have rights because they are creatures like we are, then we have, we are no different from the animals. And Chrysostom is pointing out that this thinking is diabolical. Because 
it brings us down to the level of animals. And so we have this idea, well, if animals are not monogamous, if animals just follow their instinct, then so should we. If I feel like sleeping with this person, why, why should there be anything wrong with that? After all, humans are just animals, right? Chrysostom continues, but when we tell them that all these things are fables and full of absurdity, they reply, you do not enter into the higher meaning. <laughs> In other words, you don't really, you don't have the higher level of understanding to understand the depth of this philosophy. That's what they say to the, to the Christians. And Chrysostom says, no, we do not enter into this, your surpassing nonsense, and may we never do so. So, I think Chrysostom has given us a lot to think about tonight, and I haven't even finished saying what Chrysostom says about St. Peter, how he compares Peter and Plato. Okay? Um, so let us continue and finish what he says about, and he, as he continues to compare Peter and Plato. So why does he... Now listen, Greek, all of them, we are the be beneficiary of this of Chrysostom's Greek education and that of Basil and, and Gregory the theologian. The church is not opposed to education. And if your child wants to go to Harvard, or I'm, I'm a Harvard, I'm, I went to Harvard, okay? And actually I had somebody last week ask me, why did you go to Harvard? Well, yes, I went to Holy Cross too, but I, yes, I went to Harvard. Uh, I had wonderful professors there. I phenomenal libraries there. I enjoyed it, but I knew what to use and what to discard. And this is what Chrysostom is used, is doing. It doesn't. It's not a mark against me that I went to Harvard. Chrysostom and other. But by the way, I wasn't the only Orthodox Christian there. There were other Orthodox Christians, and they maintained their orthodoxy. They knew what to receive and what to use and what to reject. And this is exactly what Chrysostom was doing. He had a mother who was a devout Christian and she educated him in the home before he went to, the, to study under Libanius, the most famous rhetorician of the day, who was a pagan. When St. When Basil and Gregor the theologian went off to Athens to study also under Libanius because he was in Athens at the time. They had a solid Christian foundation. And so imagine what Athens was like. It would like be sending your 18-year-old your to New York City to study. Okay? But they had a firm foundation. Now, not all young people have that. But they had a firm foundation so that St. Gregory said, we only knew two roads. Athens was full of all kinds of immorality and pagan temples and all kinds of, you know, temptations. But St. Gregory said, we only knew two roads. We knew the road to the church and the road to the school. So they learned, but then they used that education for the benefit of the church. They weren't persuaded by the falseness of what they learned. So you have to know your own people, when your own young person, and don't send them off to college if they're not already solidly orthodox. They don't know why. It doesn't matter that they come to church. They have to know why they come to church. They have to know what they believe and why they believe it. And then when they understand this, then they can go to a place of secular education and not be affected by it. Okay? Here's what Chrysostom says about the attitude of Peter and Plato. Peter never thought of saying any of these things. He uttered a voice like a great light shining out of the dark, a voice which scattered the mists and the darkness of the whole world. Again, his deportment, how gentle it was, how considerate, how far above all vain glory. So what he's saying here is that Peter was not promoting himself. It was not about pride, but he was talking about Christ, and he had humility and gentleness. And the philosophers were promoting their own ideas and their own thoughts, not those of Christ, of course, 
He looked toward heaven without self-elation, even when raising up the dead. But if it had come to be the power of when any one of these senseless people, in mere fantasy, of course, to do anything like it, he's talking about the philosophers. If any one of the philosophers had been able to raise the dead, if, of course, Chrysostom is saying this is fantasy, they wouldn't have been able to do it. But if they had been able to or thought about it, he would straight away have looked for an altar and a temple to be reared to him and would have wanted to be equal with the gods. He's right. Chrysostom is right. Since, in fact, when no such sign is forthcoming, they're forever indulging in such fantastic conceits. I pray to you, who is that Minerva of theirs, or Apollo, or Juna? Juno, there are different kinds of demons. And there is a king of theirs who thinks it appropriate to die for the mere purpose of being accounted equal to the gods. That's not one king, it's all of their kings. Well, not at the time of Chrysostom. But the Roman emperors, when they died, were proclaimed king. And temples were built to them and everything. Here, it is just the contrary. Hear how the apostles speak when the lame man is cured. Men of Israel, why do you look earnestly on us? He's quoting here from chapter 3 of Acts as though by our power or holiness we made him walk. We are men of like passions like you. So he's quoting the apostles. When they did these marvelous deeds, they raised the dead. They, they, they had the paralyzed man walk. They said, we are not, it's not by our power that we do these things. They, they did not seek their own glory, but attributed everything to God. Chrysostom continues, but with those, the philosophers, great is the self-elation, great is the bragging, all for the sake of men's honors, nothing for the pure love of truth and virtue. You see, that's what they're supposed to be teaching. The love of truth, the love of wisdom, the love of virtue. That's what philosophy is supposed to be about. But what motivated the philosophers was glory and honor. And Chrysostom continues, for where an action is done for glory, all is worthless. For though a man possesses all, if he does not have mastery over this lust, the love of glory, he forfeits all claim to true philosophy. He is in bondage to the most tyrannical and shameful passion. So there you have it. The most tyrannical and shameful passion is pride and the love of glory. Of course, it's a very famous saying. Many men have despised riches, but none have despised glory. This is something that motivated people, especially in antiquity. So contempt of glory is, is what Christ shows us by choosing the cross. And this is what St. Paul was saying, that we should not choose glory and honor, but the way of the cross, the way of humility, is what Christ taught us by his own example, first above all. And from this, we in the end will be glorified, but it is God who will glorify us, not we who will glorify ourselves or seek the glory of ourselves, right? And Jesus said that they that they chose, or John said, that many people chose not to believe in Christ or not to follow Christ because they preferred the glory of men rather than the glory of God. This is exactly what St. John Chrysostom is talking about here. So, at any rate, we have come to the end of our time, and next week we will continue with Peter's speech. We will see St. John Chrysostom has more wonderful things to, talk, to tell us about it, but we'll also understand and see the content of the apostolic preaching that we see in his speech, how the early church um, showed that the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all of these things that happened were fulfillment of prophecy, okay? And therefore they were true. 
So I hope you will join me next week. And now let's close with our prayer. Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Amen. Good night. <music>